Today we'll talk about a tax that's just not about money but about nudging people towards healthier choices and a better society. It's a tax imposed on goods and services which are considered harmful for society. While consumers and industry players pay the brunt of this severe tax, it's a friendly reminder by the government to pick up a healthier and happier choice. While we do that, we will also explore how the government strategically parts ways with its assets and businesses, employing tactics from retaining control to handing over total ownership. Let's begin. You're watching The Informed Investor, The Third Empire, and initiated by Research and Ranking. In the intricate complex web of a nation's fiscal policies, certain programs stand out not just for their economic significance, but for their resounding impact on societal well-being. One particular example of such is sin tax. Have you ever wondered why cigarettes or alcoholic drinks cost so much more than the production costs? That's because a significant portion of their price comprises a tax that is levied at higher rates than usual. This tax is often referred to as sin tax. In simple terms, a sin tax is a tax imposed on goods and services that are deemed harmful to society. These are typically items subject to excise tax due to their potential to cause social harm and health issues. Such goods tend to generate substantial revenue, which is why state governments often turn to sin taxes as a means of generating income. Examples of goods and services falling under this category include tobacco, cigarettes, alcohol, sugar carbonated beverages, gambling activities, etc. These items are considered socially detrimental and pose health risks. Consequently, they are subject to higher taxation rates to discourage their consumption and generate revenue for government initiatives. Sin taxes are imposed for several compelling reasons. Their primary purpose is to discourage individuals from participating in activities that are socially detrimental and harmful to health. The objective is to increase the cost of obtaining hazardous products, thereby reducing or eliminating their consumption. Simultaneously, these taxes serve as an additional source of revenue for governments. When governments' budget are in deficit, sin taxes often emerge as a favoured solution. Lawmakers frequently propose implementing such taxes as a means to bridge the budget gap. In a sense, there are two main reasons for imposing sin taxes. By significantly raising the cost of undesirable goods, Rational consumers like you and I are more likely to abandon or reduce the consumption of these harmful products. The increased price acts as a deterrent, making individuals think twice about engaging in such activities. Sin taxes contribute to higher tax revenue from companies involved in producing these goods. The increased taxation can then be allocated to fund various social welfare programs, helping to address societal needs and improve public services. Sin taxes are structured differently for various goods and services, each catering to the unique challenge posed by their consumption. The first commodity that comes to mind is that of tobacco and cigarettes. India has about 270 million people aged 15 and above who consume some form of tobacco. Tobacco is a major risk factor for several chronic diseases, including cancer. According to the World Health Organization, it accounts for 1.35 million deaths in India every year. The tobacco industry attracts central excise duty, national calamity contingent duty, GST and compensation cess as it is a sin good. Tobacco products including pan masala, cigars, cigarellos and hookah fall under the highest GST slab of 28%. In addition to this, there is a compensation cess levied under the GST law as well as excise duty and NCCCD which is levied. Moreover, the NCCD was revised upwards by 16% in the recently concluded fiscal year 23 budget. An interesting fact reported by Business Standard is the total tax burden as a percentage of the final tax inclusive retail price is about 52.7% for cigarettes, 22% for BDs and 63.8% for smokeless tobacco. So next time you smoke a cigarette, more than half of the price is for the sin you are committing and getting taxed for. The next product and industry which bears the brunt of this tax is the alcohol industry. Though GST is not charged on alcohol, various other taxes are charged. The 29 states along with 7 union territories in India have adopted different approaches 
when it comes to taxing and regulating liquor. High taxes on alcohol is also a major revenue source for states. Alcohol accounts for an interesting share of revenue in state taxes with one in every seven rupees earned by the states is expected to come from state excise, primarily alcohol. While Gujarat has completely banned liquor, other states enjoy the revenue generated from the sin people indulge in. Thereby, liquor attracts two types of taxes, excise duty and value-added tax. However, after the introduction of GST, most of the input raw materials now attract 18% GST, resulting in more increased costs. According to the International Spirits and Wine Associations of India, the apex body of the premium alcohol industry in the country, said that taxes account for nearly 67-80% to of the product prices, leaving little for trade to sustain and manage operations. A state-wise comparison indicates Karnataka, UP, Punjab and West Bengal rely more on excise duty with alcohol contributing over 20% of the tax revenue. Junk or unhealthy food has been a category suffering a higher burden for tax for many years. This kind of tax is also referred to as fat tax which is liable on junk foods and street foods that lead to body related problems and increased body weight. Previously taxed civilly under the VAT regime, the GST regime to taxes junk food at 28%. Additionally, carbonated cold drinks like Coke, Pepsi attract a 28 plus GHD plus 12 percent compensation says, making it a total rate of 40 percent. This additional says is to compensate the states for the loss of revenue arising due to the implementation of GHD. The main purpose of imposing the fat tax is to discourage consumption of unhealthy diets. Interestingly, Kerala was the first state to impose fat taxes of 14.5 percent on junk food back in 2016. The gaming industry has recently fallen under the scope of sin taxation. While previously taxed at 18%, at the 50th meeting of the GST Council, it was decided to impose a 28% GST on the entire gaming industry. With the inclusion of the new rules, the GST has been increased from 18% to 20% and would be entitled on the entire CEA, which is a contest entry amount and not on the commission charged by the company. So now, if a participant enters a gaming event, with Rs 100 as the entry fee, the company will be entitled to pay a 28% GST, the highest slab on the entire amount. On a pot of Rs 100, the company will have to deduct 28 rupees as GST first. The pot of potential winnings for a customer will drop drastically and after the gaming company takes its commission, the earnings will be taxed again at 30% as TDS as usual. The entire gaming industry will be imposed with a 28% GST on the platform fee plus 30% TDS. Many industry experts have expressed their displeasure with the new announcement saying it is very unfortunate and would lead to a nearly 1000% increase in taxation. The drastic increase in taxation, which deviates from internationally accepted practices, is seen as catastrophic for the industry. This would in turn lead to many startups either shutting down, leading to layoffs and more affecting the $2.5 billion of FDIs into the sector, jeopardizing any further inflows. Additionally, Crypto trading was brought under maximum taxation and online games, casinos and horse racing, all of them under the dreaded bracket of syntax with a flat rate of 30%. All in all, by increasing the cost of these so-called sins, the government has in recent years turned the whole argument into a purely commercial one. Syntaxes play a crucial role in shaping consumer behavior and generating revenue for the government. By imposing higher taxes on products and services that have negative societal impacts the government aims to nudge individuals towards making healthier choices while funding welfare programs. While the implementation of sin taxes can sometimes lead to industry challenges and debates, their underlying goal of creating a healthier and more prosperous society remains a central theme. By all means, individuals and companies can indulge in these sins, but these gains have to be paid or shared with the taxmen. As India continues to evolve its fiscal policies, sin taxes stand as a reminder of the intricate balance between economic considerations, public health concerns and societal well-being. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's statement that government has no business to be in business has been a significant driving force behind the concept of divestment, which has gained a lot of attention. Divestment in this context refers to the process in which government sells off its assets or subsidies such as central or public state enterprises. There are three main approaches to disinvestment. Minority disinvestment, 
majority disinvestment and complete privatization. Minority disinvestment in this approach, after the disinvestment, the government still retains a majority stake in the company, usually more than 51%. This ensures that the government maintains control over the management of the company. In majority, here the government sells off a majority of its stake in the company, which means it transfers control to the acquiring entity. However, the government might retain a smaller stake even after the sale. In this scenario, the government sells off 100% of its stake in the company, passing on complete control to the buyer. This essentially means the company becomes entirely privately owned. The motives behind this investment primarily revolves around two key points. One motivation is to provide fiscal support to the government. The resources generated through this investment can be used to repay past debts, reducing the government's interest burden. This approach helps in managing the government's financial liabilities more effectively. The second motivation focuses on enhancing the efficiency of public enterprises. By disinvesting, the government believes that private ownership and management could lead to improved operational efficiency and performance of these enterprises. This in turn could contribute positively to the overall economy. For instance, in recent times, there have been significant examples of state-run companies being privatized. In the fiscal year 22 to 23, the government completely sold its stake in the national carrier Air India. Additionally, there was a 3.5% stake sale in Life Insurance Corporation. The government also divested its remaining stakes in companies like Paradip Phosphates, Indian Petrochemicals Corporation Limited, and Tata Communications. Looking ahead to the fiscal year 23-24, the government plans to privatize several other state-run companies. These include Shipping Corporation of India, NMDC Steel, Bharat Earth Movers Limited, HLA Life Care, Container Corporation of India, and Wise Axie. Moreover, there is a plan to divest the government's holdings in IDBI Bank, although there are indications that that might not happen within the current fiscal year, as discussed in the earlier segment. The government's track record in terms of meeting its disinvestment targets has been a mix of successes and challenges with varying outcomes over the years. Starting from the past three decades, the different central governments have only managed to meet their annual disinvestment target six times. However, the BGP-led NDA government, which came to power in 2014, has been relatively successful in meeting and even surpassing its disinvestment targets on a couple of occasions. In the fiscal year 2017-18, to 18, the government exceeded expectations by earning disinvestment receipt of over 1 lakh crore against a target of 72,500 crore. Similarly, in the 2018-19 to 19 period, the government achieved 94,700 crore in disinvestment receipts, surpassing their target of 80,000 crore. However, the subsequent years have presented challenges. In fiscal year 21, despite setting an ambitious divestment target of 2.1 lakh crore, the actual achieved amount was significantly lower at 32,886 crore. The trend continued into fiscal year 22, where the government aimed for 1.75 lakh crore but managed to attain only 13,534 crore. These figures highlight the complexity and difficulty of achieving substantial divestment goals. In fiscal year 23, the government scaled down its divestment target to 65,000 crore and therefore again revised it to 50,000 crore, eventually achieving only 35,294 crore. In the 2023-24 union budget, the government has set a disinvestment goal of Rs 51,000 crore, which is a decrease of nearly 21% from the current year's budget estimate. This target is also the lowest in the past seven years. This shift in approach reflects a more practical stance prioritizing attainable objectives over setting overly ambitious targets. As of August 21, 2023, this investment received stood at a mere 5,600 crore, which is approximately 11% of the targeted amount. This suggests that the government is facing challenges in meeting its set objectives. The government is not optimistic about receiving significant funds from disinvestments because the process of selling IDBI bank may take longer than anticipated. According to finance ministry officials, the planned sales of IDBI bank Shipping Corporation of India and Concord are expected to pick up only in the next fiscal year of 24 to 25. While one of the main benefits of this investment is revenue generation for the government, with proceeds from selling shares in state-owned enterprises 
helping to bridge fiscal deficits, the impact on fiscal discipline and deficit reduction has been limited. Over a 10-year period, this investment proceeds have only accounted for 5 to 6% of the total fiscal deficit. The past three years have presented additional difficulties due to factors like pandemic-related uncertainty and geopolitical tensions which have disrupted the government's disinvestment plans. It's important to note that disinvestment also carries a political dimension as it can be a sensitive topic with various stakeholders involved. The government's ability to meet its divestment targets can set the tone for future developments. However, even if targets are not fully met, the impact on fiscal planning might not be as severe. And the government expects that they can make up for any revenue shortfalls from disinvestment by getting more non-tax revenues, including dividends from the Reserve Bank of India and state-run banks. This way, they're aiming to maintain the fiscal deficit target of 5.9% of GDP. Overall, the government's track record in disinvestment reflects a mix of achievements and challenges with the outcome influenced by a range of economic, political and global factors. With that, this is me Rahul Hassan signing off. Have a great day and stay safe. Did you like watching this video? Then download our app Informed Investor to watch more such informative and interesting videos.